I'd like to start off with uh, thanking the organizers for inviting me to speak here today and also to thank them for putting on um, such a fascinating program. It's been a really fantastic uh, meeting so far. So this is not my first slide. Um, <laughs> tech, hello. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about classical simulation of quantum computers with few non-Clifford gates. So a little bit of motivation, if it's needed, to motivate why we're interested in classically simulating quantum computers. So the theme of this meeting is, of course, the quantum classical frontier and when we're going to reach it. So many of the talks throughout this uh, meeting have been focused on trying to bring that frontier closer and closer or sooner and sooner to now by basically coming up with new interesting ideas for how we might be able to demonstrate that something is... Uh, some quantum device is superior to a classical device. But we haven't really done that if we haven't also done a thorough job in thinking about what the best possible classical algorithms are that we could come up with. So that's what this talk is about. But also there are other uses for quantum simulation methods. So verifying and validating that hardware and software do what you think they do because bugs do crop up in software and also hardware. So you need some way of checking or sec double checking that what you've got is correct. And then also this question of benchmarking performance to improve design. So maybe you have two different methods of doing something and you want to know which one is best. And as we saw yesterday uh, with this kind of Trotter Suzuki decompositions, there can be different ways to do this. And whilst the lower bounds tell you that you need a certain number of gates to achieve a certain accuracy, in actual fact, when you look at the uh, kind of numerical analysis, what you find is you need a much smaller number of gates. So if we can get better and better tools for simulating larger and larger uh, quantum systems, then there's some hope that we might be able to better benchmark their performance and not rely on analytic bounds that are pe pessimistic. Okay, so I'm going to kind of broadly classify all simulators into three categories. The first one is the brute force attempt, where you just write down the whole wave function, and this will get you up to, say, 30, 40 qubits, depending on what your hardware is like. It's going to be exponential in the number of qubits but polynomial in the number of gates that you're going to apply. So this kind of second category, which we've heard quite a bit about so far in this meeting, is kind of tensor network approaches. So here, you have an overhead that's going to scale more polynomially in the number of qubits. So IBM have a recent paper where they simulate a 56 qubit device. But it's going to be exponential in the depth. And it's more suited to circuits where the depth can be understood because there's actually a number of the, the layers are explicitly 1 or 2D or have some kind of locality structure. But what I'm going to focus on throughout this whole talk is another approach which I'll call stabilizer simulation, where again you kind of respect this huge beastie Hilbert space, this huge enormous and exponential Hilbert space, and try to do things in a way that's polynomial in the number of qubits, uh, but has some exponential overhead. So the exponential overhead is going to be in the number of non-Clifford gates, so T gates or Toffley gates. But you're going to be able to handle a polynomial number of Clifford gates, so control not. Hadamard or the S phase gate, and also you're not so constrained by locality, so you don't have to worry about the kind of locality constraints that you might have with tensor networks. So that's going to be the different types of simulators that I'm going to talk about today, and I'm going to give you more of a kind of overview talk. I'm going to mention some old ideas, some newer ideas, some ideas by other people, and uh, I won't go into any huge amount of detail for each one of them, just kind of give you an overview of what the different kinds of stabilizer simulators are out there at the moment. So the earliest work on this, which demonstrated that it is in principle possible, is this paper by Aronson and Gottsman, which showed that, for example, if you have n t gates, then you can simulate this with a runtime that scales like 4 to the power of n. So this is a really, really quickly growing exponential. So you're not going to get to a circuit with very many t gates doing this. But th all they really wanted to do was a proof of principle, that you could have a, something that has these kinds of scaling properties on the right-hand side. What we're interested here is trying to basically tame this exponential, take it down to a more gentle, gentle exponential, so there's some hope that we might be able to get to a larger, larger system sizes. So this is the, the structure of my talk. So I'll give you some background material on what I would call the magic state model of computation or the stabilizer model of computation. And then three sections that describe three different types of simulators. So the first kind of simulators are going to be quasi-probability or Monte Carlo simulators. And the next two are kind of similar. They kind of, you might group them together even because they're both going to be stabilizer rank simulators. But the thing that differentiates them is that one is going to be exact and the other one's going to be approximate. 
So here are some references for these different sections. So the quasi-probability simulator work is mostly based on this paper by myself and Mark Howard, also building what other people have done in quasi-probability simulation. And the ideas uh, behind stabilizer rank simulators go back to two IBM papers. So one for exact simulation and one for approximate. But I'm also going to tell you today about some new work, which is in progress slash in preparation, which is this larger collaboration of people here, which includes myself, uh, Sergey, David Gossett, Mark Howard, Dan Brown, uh, who's at UCL, and Dan Brown's student. So let's cover the background material. So before we define the magic state model of computation, we've got to say what the stabilizer model of computation is. So this is a model of computation where you can prepare stabilizer states, you can perform Clifford unitaries, you can measure Pauli operators, and you can perform classical feedback forward and adaptivity. So um, the stabilizer states include things just like the computational basis state, 0, 1. The control, and the Clifford operations include control not, Hadamard, S gate, so you can generate entanglement, superposition, all of these things. But such circuits can be simulated using the celebrated gutzmann nil theorem or method. So you have some polynomial scaling in the amount of time and bits that you need to simulate such a circuit. So to make this universal, you can add essentially almost anything that isn't Clifford and get a universal gate set. So a kind of go-to thing is the uh, pi over 8 or T gate. But you don't actually have to have the gate. You can instead have this thing here, which is the T magic state. So you can have this instead because this circuit on the right-hand side is what we call a state injection circuit. So if you have one copy of this T state, you can perform a control knot, make a measurement. If you get the zero outcome, you've definitely implemented the T gate. If you get the one outcome, then you need to apply some other small Clifford correction. But in both cases, once you've done the correction or not, you end up with the gate that you wanted. So you can deterministically get the gate from having the state. This is a fairly well-known fact. Uh, it's maybe slightly less well-known is that there are other states and gates that do this. There are other ways that you can deterministically inject a unit tree that's not Clifford. So here is an example, which is the control control Z gate, this phase gate that just adds a, a, a minus one if it's in the 111 state. And this is closely related to the Toffley gate. So it crops up in lots of reversible logic circuits. And we can associate with this gate a CCZ magic state, which is just the CCZ unit tree applied to the plus 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 state. And then we can deterministically use this magic state to inject the gate. So um, again, we do a sequence of control knots and measurements, and we have to apply some Clifford correction depending on what the measurement signatures are. So more generally, we can characterize the whole family of unit trees and magic states that we can use as resources to deterministically inject unit trees. So if we've got a unit tree, which is diagonal, and we conjugate it, so U, Pauli, U dagger, and we end up with a Clifford for every single Pauli that we tried to do this with, then we say that this unit tree belongs in the third level of the Clifford hierarchy. And it means that this circuit here can be used to deterministically inject the unit tree U. So the reason for this, the connection between the maths and the circuit, is that these Clifford corrections correspond to just the Cliffords that you get when you perform this conjugation operation. So in this talk, we'll call such magic states Clifford magic states, because in addition to being able to use them, to deterministically inject some non-Clifford unit tree, we can think of them as being eigenstates of some Clifford. So they're stabilized by some Clifford unit tree, much the same way that a stabilizer state can be uniquely defined as an eigenstate of some Pauli operators. The Clifford magic states are going to be uniquely defined as the eigenstate of some Clifford unit trees. So these are going to play a special role in, our, um, talk, to, in the talk today because they can be used to deterministically inject. So this gives us the magic state model of computation, where we have everything that we could uh, had earlier in the stabilizer model of computation as a kind of free or easy thing to do, an easily simulatable component. And then we add some number of components which are, uh, don't fit inside this formalism, which give us magic states. And then we ask, how hard is it to simulate this system? And we ask, what does the simulation cost in terms of how, much, how many magic states there are, or how much magic there is? If we think like entanglement theory, we're not just interested in how many entangled states we have, but how much entanglement there is. So there's an analogy here between the resource theory of entanglement and magic. So I'm on the first of my three categories of simulators that I want to talk about today. So the first class of these quasi-probability simulators, and I'm mostly going to talk about work with Mark Howard. So, what is a quasi-probability distribution? So anyone with a physics background that's done quantum optics or thought about superconducting circuits will be familiar with a, a picture like this, which illustrates the Wigner function of a system. So a Wigner function is a quasi-probability distribution because 
it integrates to one, much like a probability distribution. And also, if we take marginals of, that give us the position or the momentum degrees of freedom, then we find we also have a positive valued function. But it's not quite a probability distribution because it can be negative in some places. So that's what a quasi-probability distribution is, but we're not interested in continuous variable systems today. We're interested in more discrete forms of computation. So it's not well known that there's a, a very good and robust analog of Wigner function for QDIT quantum computers, so where you have a D-level system that you use to build up your quantum computer, and D is an odd number. So in this case, you can define a Wigner function such that the Wigner function is positive whenever you have a stabilizer state. And furthermore, it's been shown that if you add up all the amounts of places where it's negative, you can quantify the negativity or mana of a, of a certain state. And this is a good way to measure the kind of non stabilizerness of a state. Um, and also, by Pasha et al., that uh, if you perform a simulation algorithm, what you'll find is that you can simulate a circuit that has some number of these magic states with an overhead that scales with the amount of negativity in the quasi-probability distribution. So that's really interesting, but it, unfortunately, there's kind of some mathematical curiosities, which means that it doesn't translate over nicely to the qubit setting. So in the qubit setting, if you try to define a Wigner function that works in such a way that it's uh, positive for all stabilizer states, it simply doesn't. There's always a stabilizer state such that the distribution looks negative. So we wanted to come up with some other idea of what a quasi-probability distribution could be for a qubit magic state model of computation. And this is what we came up with. We said, let's just write our state down as a density matrix, as a sum of density matrices which are stabilizer states, with some probability in front of them. But now let's think about this as being a quasi-probability. And it turns out that all states, even if they're not stabilizer states, can be written in this form, provided you allow for the possibility that the probabilities can become negative. So we can um, always write a state in this decomposition, and then we can quantify how far away it is from being a stabilizer state by taking the sum of the absolute values of this, this value p. And this gives us a good measure, which we call the robustness of magic of a state. So it's well behaved, it satisfies all the usual criteria that you would want to have if you were building a kind of resource theory of magic. But the one, the one really important criteria today is that it's operationally meaningful in some sense. So what I mean by operationally meaningful is that this quantity, the robustness, tells you how hard it is to classically simulate a circuit that has, um, to how hard it is to classically simulate the circuit using a specific algorithm. And the runtime and algorithm that I'll describe on the next slide scales with the robustness squared. So I'm just going to give you a rough overview of what this algorithm is. And it draws heavily on other algorithms that have been, uh, that are quasi-probability algorithms. So we're going to take our circuit, we're going to break it down into Clifford operations and then magic states that we can inject in to give the non-Clifford component. And then we're going to build a prob renormalized probability distribution. So we just take the absolute value of each of the probabilities and divide it by something such that the sum of our probabilities actually goes to one now. And then we're going to loop through a procedure that takes many, 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 many samples. So in each iteration of the loop, we choose one sample, sigma i, some, some stabilizer state with a probability pi. And then what we do is we simulate our Clifford circuit acting on this state. And at the end of the circuit, we imagine that there's some, some measurement that we make. So we take the outcome of this measurement, which will have value plus 1 or minus 1. And we output it. But before we output it, we multiply it by some extra prefactor. And the extra prefactor is going to be the, the robustness of the state, and then also the sign, whether it was a positive or a negative contribution to the state. And if you do this, then what you find is that the random variables that are coming out of this machine have a mean that is the same mean as you would get from actually running the quantum computation. But the variance is much, much larger. So to combat this increase in variance, you need more and more samples. And using simple inequalities, one can find that the number of samples has to square like the robustness squared. So that's essentially what's going on with the algorithm. And then the interesting question becomes, if we want to really minimize the robustness, because that's what the simulation overhead is dictated by, then how do we find good decompositions? And we can do this just using uh, convex optimization, simple convex and linear programming tools from MATLAB. But the interesting thing is that there's something slightly counterintuitive, which is that if I wanted to find a decomposition of many copies of a t-state, I could work it out for one t-state and then just copy it n times. But what happens is that if I take a larger block, say two or three of these t-states, and run this convex optimization problem, then what I find is that I get a robustness which is slightly smaller than you might have expected. 
So instead of just taking your end states, because it's, well, if you took all end states and tried to calculate the robustness, it would be intractable, so you can't do it. So you instead block it up into smaller blocks, and the largest block that we could manageably calculate the robustness so far is for five qubits. So that gives us some scaling that tells us that if we want to simulate a circuit that has um, T, such of these T states, it's going to have a runtime that scales like this. So I've mostly talked about T states, but we're not limited to just T states. We can also think about these other states, these other Clifford magic states that we could deterministically inject. And if we look at, for example, the CCZ state, we can again run our convex optimization and find a value for what the robustness is. So the interesting thing here is that CCZ, or Toffley, is something that we know we can synthesize using four T gates. So then you can compare which one's the best. Should I build this circuit using a CCZ gadget, or should I build this circuit using four T states? And what you find is that the scaling is going to be much, much higher if you actually broke it down into T gates. So what this suggests is that we should be really taking our circuits and trying to find some way to break them down into sub-circuits where the, the robustness or the difficulty of simulating them is as low as we could hope for. So that's everything that I wanted to say today about the quasi-probability simulators. I'm going to move on to the, the first of the two parts of the stabilizer rank work. So um, much of this work was first introduced in this IBM paper. I'm going to review what's covered in this IBM paper and also then go on to introduce some new, a selection of new results from this paper that is hopefully soon to be written. So let's start off with a definition. So stabilizer rank, the name kind of comes from Schmidt rank. So if you know what Schmidt rank is, it's basically if I have some entangled state and I try to write it as a superposition of different separable states, how many terms do I need? So here we're asking, if I write my non-stabilizer state as a superposition of stabilizer states, what's the minimum number of terms that I can possibly use to get this? So if we define such a quantity, we again find it's a well-behaved monotone, and it satisfies all the axioms that people normally look for in a good way of quantifying a resource. And the important one for today really is that it's operationally meaningful. So we have an algorithm that has a, a runtime, well, IBM proposed an, the group at IBM proposed an algorithm that has a runtime that scales with the stabilizer rank. So we're interested in what the algorithm is and how to minimize the stabilizer rank of states. So I'll give you an overview of the simulation method now. So again, we gadgetize our circuit, we break it down into Clifford and magic states, and we try to find a low stabilizer rank decomposition of our state. And then we take our circuit, which we can think of as being a Clifford followed by a projector onto some outcome of some measurements that you've made, and we look at how this affects each individual term in the decomposition. Now, because each term is a stabilizer state, and this is just a Clifford operation, we can calculate the new state resulting after we've applied this, this process. Now, this state might not be normalized anymore. It might be subnormalized, which is an important point. So once we've done that, we want to know the probability of getting that particular outcome. So what we have to do is we have to work out what the norm of this subnormalized state is now. So in order to do that, there are two different ways that you can do it. So the first one, which is from the original Bravi Smith Smolin paper, is that you exactly calculate it by taking the, the bra and the ket and putting them together and summing over all the terms. So each one of these, uh, both the bra and the ket, have chi terms, so you end up with chi squared terms. And each one of them is an overlap between two subnormalized stabilizer states. And so these are things that we know how to calculate. And so you can exactly calculate what the probability of this particular outcome of this run is with a complexity that scales with chi squared. But in a later paper by Bravi and Gossett, they showed that you can actually get a better scaling, which only runs with chi, which is a very, very significant saving, um, at some price that there's a small multiplicative error by uh, approximating this norm estimation procedure. So that, there's a, a lot of technical details there today that I won't go into. The important take home message is that you is if you find states with low chi, you can find a runtime that scales with chi psi rather than chi squared chi. Okay. So again, we find that there's a situation where if we want to try and take lots and lots of states and find the exact stabilizer rank, we can't do that. So what we instead do is we break it up into smaller blocks and we find this kind of counterintuitive thing happens again, that if we take blocks of two or five, then the stabilizer rank is smaller than what you might have expected based on what you knew for a single state. So for a single state, the stabilizer rank is two. You have to always have to write it as two terms. 
but for two states, it's still two, which is really surprising. So there are two entangled states that you can use to, to write the state um, in terms of. And this gives you a lower overhead, but you can go even further and find a decomposition in terms of six qubits, and that gives you an even lower overhead yet. So you might have numbers that you might have noticed that maybe these numbers aren't so large, what the stabilizer ranks are, and it didn't actually change going from one to two. So this quantity, chi, is telling us what the complexity is of simulating our circuit. And it's constant, and then it looks like it's going up linearly. So I would call this the world's least convincing exponential. <laughs> um, we can go a little bit further in numerics, and we can actually get up to seven copies of a state, and we find that it's jumped up quite a significant amount. So it looks like it behaves linearly and then starts acting exponentially, which is, I guess, what you would expect. But I think it's really important to comment at this point that the rigorous lower bounds that we have on this are very, very trivial. There are no exponential lower bounds on this. So if you actually believe that maybe we should be able to classically simulate a quantum computer, then this is a potential place that you could do it. If you could actually find a polynomial, um, a polynomial scaling stabilizer rank decomposition of a state, then you would have an algorithm for efficiently simulating a quantum computer, and there's no known result for why that wouldn't be true, despite numerous attempts. Now, personally, I don't think that's the case, and I spend more of my energy trying to find uh, a lower bound than um, trying to find something which has polynomial scaling. So that's the, the T state, and much in the spirit of the earlier part of the talk as well. Um, some of the new ideas that we're cooking up revolve around saying, well, maybe I can get a much better simulation method if instead of breaking up my circuit into Clifford plus T, I break it up into some other gate set. So if I want to do some rotation about the z-axis and I use optimal synthesis methods, then what you find is that to get a, a good rotation, say, to a high level of accuracy, you need hundreds of T-gates. So we're not going to be able to do a single rotation using this method. So instead, what you can do is you can take some other magic state, which basically corresponds to um, some other rotation, say u theta, and use this fact here, that when you try to inject it, if you get the zero outcome, you get the unitary that you wanted. If you get the one outcome, then actually there's some correction that should be applied, which is again a non-Clifford correction. So you could go through the process of trying to uh, put a gadget and then another gadget that you might use if you need to do the correction. But actually, none of that is necessary, because when you do one of these simulations, what you can do is you can just post-select in your classical device on a particular outcome. So that means that the, the simulation complexity of implementing the, the state, the unitary u theta, is going to depend on what the stabilizer rank of this other resource is. So here's some numerics that we did that look at what the uh, stabilizer rank is of a generic state theta. So what do I mean by generic? I mean, pick a random state and take sure that it's not, say, the t state, which will never happen by chance, or a stabilizer state, and then calculate numerically what the stabilizer rank is. So here, actually, every single state that we check has exactly the same stabilizer rank. And it's almost the same as what you have for a t state. So again, it has this flat behavior and then looks linear and then looks like it's starting to behave exponentially again. Sometimes it differs by, sometimes the t state can have a slightly left, slower rank. And the reason for this is probably because it has some extra symmetry that the other states don't have. But almost every other state behaves the same way. So that was the kind of numerical result. And it kind of got us thinking, scratching our heads, what can we say in terms of pen and paper proofs? So here's one theorem. If, I, if you give me a single qubit state, and then t copies of it, where t is some number that's less than or equal to 5, then the stabilizer rank will obey this uh, linear scaling. Furthermore, actually, it's kind of surprising that there's, one, there's always one set of stabilizer states that you can use, and that set of stabilizers, you don't have to search for them. There's a fixed set of stabilizer states that you know you'll be able to use to write this state down. So, for example, if I have t equals 5, then um, I can take five copies of any of the single qubit product states, and this will allow me to uh, form a stabilizer decomposition with less than six terms. Okay? And the reason for this is that one can show that this set of six stabilizer states will span the symmetric subspace. And since all of the product states sit in the symmetric subspace, you must be able to decompose them in terms of these product states. So there's also a slightly more sophisticated version of this result, which looks at multi-qubit states. So if you give me an n-qubit state, 
Then it follows that if I take t copies of it, where t is less than or equal to 3, then the stabilizer rank is going to be less than or equal to the dimension of the symmetric subspace. And in some sense, that's the best that we could ever hope for using this proof technique, because what we're doing is we're looking for a set of stabilizer states that spans the symmetric subspace, and then concluding that, therefore, any state that's a product state with respect to that um, symmetric subspace must be able to be decomposed in terms of those states. And why does the number three crop up? It's probably an artifact of the proof technique. So the proof technique at the moment uses this result that um, the set of stabilizer states forms a projective three design. So in fact, I think this is probably five or bigger and may even scale with, with n. But at the moment, we just know that it's true for t equals three or less. So that's everything that I wanted to say about exact stabilizer rank. I'm going to tell you about approximate stabilizer rank now, which again was introduced by an IBM team, so uh, Sergey Gravi, um, Bravi and David Gossett. And I'm going to review their work and then again mention some new ideas in this unpublished uh, notes that we're writing up at the moment. So approximate stabilizer rank is defined in terms of exact stabilizer rank. You take your state and you, try, you, define, you take some error, delta, that you're happy with, and you try to find another state that's delta close to your original one, but has low stabilizer rank, significantly lower than the original one that you had. So you've got a state psi, but instead you work with a state thigh that has much, much lower rank, but is quite close in fidelity or some other measure that you like. And then what this means is that if you use this for the purpose of simulation, then you're going to be able to simulate the circuit with some delta-dependent error, uh, but with a much, much lower overhead, which I think is on the next slide. Okay, So I'll quickly review the bravi gossett construction for how you get these low stabilizer rank approximations. So one way to think about it is that you've got the T state, and you can write it kind of in the composition. It's not quite the composition basis. What I've done here is I've written it as a superposition of two terms that I've labeled 0 and 1, but rotated by this operator here that isn't a unit tree. Right? So in fact, this will be something like uh, the zero state and the plus state once you've applied this. Um, well, sorry, two different equatorial states. And the reason why we write it that way is that it allows us to write many, many copies of the T state as a superposition over all of these uh, vectors x. So x goes over all possible binary strings of the right length, but multiplied by tensor products of this operator r. So once you've written it in that fashion, the approximation is simply to take some subset. Actually, what they do is they take a linear subspace of all possible binary strings and sum over though just those terms. So because you're summing over a small number of terms, the rank is lower. What they show is that if you choose this randomly with high probability, given some delta, you can always find something, some approximation state that has a rank that scales like this. So there's some delta dependence, but this exponent is, is less than we had earlier. So I'm aware that every few slides I bring up a number, and you probably can't remember what the numbers are. So just in case you're wondering about that, at the end of the talk, I'll come back to all of the numbers and give you a comparison. So that's the kind of previous work. I should probably say that uh, the Bravi Gossett paper deserves much more than a single slide. It has much more technical content, including this proof that you can simulate systems with a overhead that scales like chi instead of chi-squared, and lots of other techniques. But for the purpose of this talk, we're just interested in knowing that it's told us that if we can find a low, um, a low rank state that approximates our original state, then we have an advantage. So what we have now is a more generalized construction. The previous one just worked for T states. So this construction will work for all states. So what we do instead is we write our state out again, and we again find some probability distribution, which we make by taking the absolute value of these coefficients and renormalizing. And what we do is we just randomly take states with this probability pj and form an approximate state. And if we choose enough, the more terms we take, the larger the rank will be, but also the better the approximation. And what we're able to show is that the stabilizer rank, if you want to aim for some precision delta, will have to scale in a way that depends on the, some of the absolute values of this C here. So the simulation overhead is now captured by the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients, whereas before it was captured by the number of coefficients. So there's kind of a zero norm optimization and a one norm optimization at work here, and there may even be other kinds of um, optimization that are important. So there's a 
Because you want this quantity to be small to get a better simulation, you want to find the lowest possible value of this one norm of the C vector. So this actually turns out to be, uh, again, a convex or linear program. And uh, we'll denote the solution of such a problem by C star. So that's just the smallest possible value that you could hope for for a given state. And we actually know, unlike with stabilizer rank, where we knew very little, we actually know quite a lot about this quantity C star. So we can give a lot of lower bounds on what it has to be. So as is often the case with a, a convex optimization problem, you have what's called the primal problem, the original problem that you had, but then you also have a dual problem. And the dual problem is also something that you can fairly easily solve, and it gives you a lower bound on the original problem. And every um, possible choice of variables that you have for the dual problem gives you something that I would call a witness. So this is similar to the idea of uh, entanglement witness in physics. And here, what we find is that the witness is actually a quantum state. So for every quantum state that you give me, I can find a lower bound on this C star, which is this, this number that quantifies how hard it is to simulate uh, a circuit using psi as a magic state. So how does the lower bound work? Well, you have the overlap between the original state and the one you're using as a witness divided by the fidelity of the, the witness. So what do I mean by fidelity? I mean the maximum overlap between the witness and the set of all possible stabilizer states. So that's the kind of algebraic definition, but you can also think about these things geometrically as well. So the, the set of stabilizer states forms some convex shape, and it's divided from all other states by a series of hyperplanes. And these witnesses, or at least the good witnesses, tend to correspond to facets of, this, um, facets of these polytopes. And they're trying to look, is the state somewhere out here? So you get a lower bound for every kind of witness, but some witnesses are better than others. So, so you can have a trivial witness. So a trivial witness is one where the witness is trying to find out if the state is over here somewhere, but the state isn't even on that side of the hyperplane, so it doesn't tell you anything non-trivial. So the witness might tell you that um, C star is bigger than some number, but that number is less than one, and you knew that it had to be bigger than one anyway. You can have a bound which is non-trivial because it gives you some actual constant that's bigger than one, and it tells you that C star has to be bigger than that, but it might not be an optimal witness. It turns out that for these kinds of convex optimization problems, uh, so-called strongly, strongly dual convex optimization problems, there will always be an optimal witness, an optimal witness that actually tells you what the value of C star is. And this fact allows you to prove quite a few things. So, one particular interesting witness that we can take is we can actually just take the witness to be the state itself. And if you do that, you get a simpler lower bound, which is just that this thing, C star, which quantifies the difficulty of simulating the circuit, is lower bounded by the fidelity. So the fidelity with respect to the set of stabilizer states. And furthermore, if the magic state that you're interested in is one of these Clifford magic states, the ones that we know we can use to deterministically inject a unit tree, then the mirror witness, I've only just started calling it that, so let's see if it survives into the paper. The mirror witness is going to be optimal. So it actually tells you what C star is, and it also tells you what the decomposition is. So the decomposition then becomes, um, so I've got a summation here. So the summation is over a whole bunch of different Cs, which are Cliffords. And the Cs are the Cliffords that stabilize the magic state. Remember, that's how we define the Clifford magic state. It's a state that's an eigenstate of some group of Clifford unit trees. So we sum over all the symmetries of the state, apply to some stabilizer state, and the stabilizer state that we use is just the one that maximizes the fidelity up here. So that's a nice, clean story. There's only one part of it which isn't clean, which is that actually solving this optimization problem is hard. Okay? So finding the closest stabilizer state is a hard problem. But the, the more effort you put in to finding the, smallest sta the closest stabilizer state, the more efficient your um, simulation algorithm is going to be. <clears throat> so, for example, we can look for the closest stabilizer state to the CCZ state, and we find that one of the closest states is just plus, plus, plus. And this gives us some value for the, the fidelity. And then we can just invert this, and we get some scaling, uh, which tells us what the overhead is of simulating a circuit with n CCZs. And again, as before, if we, instead of using the CCZ gadget, broke it down into four T gates and some Cliffords, then what we would find is we'd get a much worse scaling. So it's better to work with larger segments of circuit. So on the right-hand side here, I have some prelim um, preliminary data from MATLAB. 
So we believe that we could probably get to larger scales than what we've done so far. And it's a, a runtime against runtime plot, which I guess is quite unusual. But what we're trying to illustrate here is the advantage of using the CCZ gadgets versus the T gadgets with all other features of the code held constant. And what we see is that we've got these scatter points going on up here. And if the two um, simulation methods compared the same, we'd have equal runtime. But actually, we have um, another line here, which would be exactly a factor 10 speed up. And we're kind of, at the moment, our numerics are around the regime where we're seeing a factor 10 speed up. But we think we can probably get to, um, well, we, we, we think we can probably look at larger systems, and then the speed up would be greater. Because the difference between using T gadgets and CCZ gadgets is exponentially separated. OK, so I've given you the background material and also the three different types of simulators, the three different types of stabilizer simulators that I wanted to talk about. So I'm just going to give you a couple of slides now that overview, put all of the numbers together, because the numbers were all on completely different slides. And also to take, clear, take sure it's clear who did what bits of work, because I realize I've just clumped lots of things together into one talk. So in some sense here, this is maybe I might think of it as the prior art slide. So we have this result from a long time ago by Aronson and Gotsman, which just shows this proof of principle thing that it's possible to do these kinds of stabilizer simulators with some exponential scaling. Um, but they have a very large 4 to the n or m. So here I've got the T gate, the CCZ gate, and I wanted to have something else that wasn't a Clifford magic state. It was just some other gate that was a small rotation, and so I picked the square root of T. So that's a good proof of principle. Then we have these exact and approximate stabilizer rank results that both came from IBM papers, and these gave much improved scalings on the exponential uh, overhead of T gates. So there's, although the scaling here is better for the approximate case than the exact, there is some price you pay in terms of some constant factor slowdowns. So in work with Mark Howard, we kind of conjured up this idea of quasi-probability simulators, and we looked at how they perform for T gadgets and CCZ gadgets. And so we get some exponential scaling, which is, so this, number, this was kind of the first paper where people started quoting things for CCZ. Um, we have some scaling here, which is not as good as these ones, which is a little bit disappointing. But I, would, I think there are maybe some advantages to the quasi-probability approach and set um, regardless. So the, the two main ones are that it works for noisy circuits. It works, it's inherently defined for things that are written as density matrices rather than pure states. So it works for no noisy circuits. Not only does it work for noisy circuits, but as you add more noise, the simulation gets easier and easier and easier and easier. So if you have a very, very noisy circuit, then the simulation is probably not even going to be that difficult using a quasi-probability method. The other possible advantage to using quasi-probability simulators is that it's, it's one of these kind of like embarrassingly parallelizable problems. So the overhead is the number of samples that we have to choose and then run the simulation. So we could just have many, many different computers just choosing samples from different, um, and then adding up all the results at the end. So we could massively parallelize it. It's less clear to me the extent to which the stabilizer rank methods can be parallelized, although it's definitely something that's worth looking at. Um, having said that, the exact and approximate have much better exponential scaling. So in this much alluded to in progress, in preparation work, um, we kind of fill out some gaps here. So we look at ideas for doing CCZ gadgets, so these Clifford magic states, but also some other things that don't sit neatly into this Clifford magic formalism. And we find that, so maybe some notable things are that for the exact stabilizer rank, because there wasn't really much difference in what the rank was, whether I took a T state or some other angle, what you find is the scaling is roughly the same in these two boxes here. Whereas when you go to the approximate stabilizer rank case, you see a definite separation between doing small angle rotations and bigger angle rotations. So as you make the angle of the rotation smaller and smaller and smaller, in the approximate case, the simulation becomes easier and easier and easier. There is some price, some constant factor price that depends on the level of the approximation. <coughs> so that's everything that I wanted to tell you about today. Um, some, oh, no, one more slide. <laughs> what are the future plans? Well, there's one obvious future plan, which is that I keep alluding to a, a paper that's in progress, in preparation. So we're going to write that. Um, but the, we have plans beyond that, which is that we would like to make an implementation of all of these ideas. I mean, I kind of think of this work as being preparatory work to actually writing some software that could go into something. For example, we're thinking about writing, writing these quasi-probability simulators. No, sorry, the stabilizer rank simulators. Uh, in a way that they can be used easily within QuizKit. 
and trying to you know, optimize them as much as possible. So this is kind of like preparatory work to try and settle in our minds what is definitely the best thing to write in QuizKit. So thank you for listening. So, very nice. Thank you. Um, one thing that I, I got lost on. So, you talked about general theta, and mm -hmm. in at least one of your your slides, there was this slightly surprising result that all all theta rotations required the same cost for that method. Mm -hmm. So, over all the methods, if I want to simulate very small rotations, is there a method that allows me to do that relatively cheaply? Well, I think if they're um, I think if there's small rotations and there's no noise, then I suggest using this kind of new approximate stabilizer rank method that's being written up at the moment. Maybe this 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 oh. Let's go ahead. Hi, yeah. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for a great talk. Um, I just wanted to find out if there's, you know, um, I think this kind of stabilizer basis that you use in this quasi-probabilistic mm -hmm. um, uh, framework is, is really nice, but I want, you know, there's a lot of freedom in that framework to potentially choose other bases, and I just wonder if you guys have looked at potentially choosing other high-dimensional bases that will um, really reduce the negativity. Other, other frames, you mean? Yeah, other yeah. kinds of frames. Um, no, this is something that Mark Howard suggested a couple of times, but we haven't got, no. We haven't looked at any of those. Um. Thank you. I assume in this chart everything has a big O. Yeah. And a lot of these numbers, like 1.17 and 1.12, look quite the same. And because we're using a classical computer, we're not going to be going to t equals billion, for example, right? So I'm assuming maybe the constants might make a difference, but you have 1.17, you have some very close numbers there. Um, well, for all of these, the constants will be roughly the same, but if you go between the exact stabilizer rank and the approximate stabilizer rank, there will be a constant that matters. I so. see, so my question is that um, at the beginning you said that matrix product states can do 50 qubits or something like that, yeah. and I wonder how far you've tried to push this. Yeah, I also qubit. wonder. <laughs> <laughs> you also wonder, yeah. so, it would be very exciting to see. So maybe comment on some differences. So in the, in the matrix product state approach, even control not gates and Clifford gates have some cost associated with them, whereas here they have zero cost. You're also limited in terms of uh, the topology of a device. So maybe it's the case that if you're looking at one of these random nearest neighbor simulations of um, a superconducting circuit which is locked into 2D topology, then maybe it is the case that doing matrix product state is going to be the best simulator you can hope for. But if you have some other topology, or you do find that for whatever reason, uh, performing Clifford gates is easier than other gates. So for instance, if you're benchmarking um, some fault tolerance protocol, and there's loads of Clifford gates throughout the fault, fault tolerance protocol, then it's going to be much, much easier to use something where the, fault, the Clifford gates are free. Yeah. Uh, in terms of how far we think we can get, well, there are already simulations that have done circuits that have, say, 45 or 50 um, qubits in them. But honestly, I don't think that you should think 45 or 50, uh, well, 45 T gates, I think. But you shouldn't maybe think of that too seriously as a limitation of the methodology. Because if you look at this uh, recent IBM paper where they do 56 qubits using matrix product states, they're using state-of-the-art um, supercomputing hardware and very, very optimized code, right? This is code that's put together in MATLAB run on a, on a laptop, right? So in terms of future work, one of the questions definitely is, what's the most you can possibly hope for on highly, highly optimized code run on a supercomputer? And we just don't know Yeah. There is a poster yesterday that did 60 qubits with, um, with matrix product states for Shor's algorithm. OK. That sounds good. <laughs> so I should have put 60 at the beginning of my talk instead of 56 then. I mean, sometimes you have to be careful with these things, because especially for matrix product states, it depends on the depth. So I just put 56. I think the depth then was something like 23, somewhere in the 20s. So it also depends on the depth. 
No other questions? Maybe one quick last one? All right, if there are no other questions, let's thank Earl again.